Hello everyone there on Facebook. We are live and a minute early. I can do it. <laughs> it is possible. Susan can do this early. We we managed. It's it's six six thirty in California, so we're we're on it, and it's nine thirty in in Old Maybe. Town, Maine. Yeah. <laughs> so we are here. It is Susan Gerpik, and we are doing a yet another episode with the fabulous, amazing Janice Poyton, and we're going to be talking about facilitating communication, but in a whole different angle. You know, back in the day, Janice and I said, "There's no way we'll be doing more than two two like two talks. We're on like talk twelve or something. I don't know about yes. facilitating communication. We've got a lot more planned for you all. So." Before we introduce our speaker today, or our speaker, our, <laughs> our guest, um, I want to let everybody know that to make sure that you um, <laughs> that you go to and like our Facebook page, which is About Time um, Project, and also like our YouTube channel. You guys, come on, we're at 86, and I need to have 100. Come on, it's, it doesn't cost anything. I'll start paying people to go in. <laughs> After we get a hundred, it's just a little, little milestone. It makes me feel good. After we hit a hundred, then we get extra, we can do some extra things on the, uh, on the YouTube channel that I'd really like to be able to do. So, um, you know, I'd really appreciate if you would just give me and give us a, a, a subscribe. Plus all these talks that are, we're doing on Facebook, they will eventually go over to our YouTube channel. So um, subscribe so you'll know when we have a new talk, as well as when we're going to Facebook, if you're interested in following us on Facebook, and then you can you can change your notifications so that when Susan Gerbic goes live, you'll be able to um, get a little notification, and they'll give you like no notice whatsoever that I'm live now, which is how my life feels. All right, so Janice, will you please introduce our guest? Sure. Um, today we're talking to Michael Burke, and it's a. Uh, as people, most people who have been following us know that I was a former facilitator and now am a skeptic about it. And um, it's kind of rare that I get to um, talk with reporters other than when they call me for interviews and stuff. So we, um, we get to dig into that a little bit. Michael was a um, student at Syracuse University, which is ground zero for facilitated communication. And oh, I just wanted to say that if you're not familiar with facilitated communication, please go back and watch our, our other videos that we've done. Um, we have uh, samples of what it is and all that, but we're not gonna get into that, um, that specifically today. We're gonna talk more about Michael's experience as a reporter, student reporter, um, who's, who was critical of, of facilitated communication um, through, and we'll find out what that process was like for him. So, um, Michael, I'm wondering if you could just give us a, one of the things that that proponents write about is they wonder about the um, experience and knowledge of the people who are critical of, of FC. And so that's part of the reason why we're doing um, these talks to let people kind of explain that. So could you just give us like a background and also where where you're at right now? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, right now I'm. Um still a reporter. Uh, I've since graduated from Syracuse, graduated in 2018, and now I'm in California where I cover schools out here, um, K through 12 and also higher ed. So it's been a couple of years since I was at Syracuse. Um, but um, as you mentioned, Syracuse is sort of the ground zero uh, epicenter for facilitated communication. And um, yeah, I never really set out to or, or thought of myself necessarily as a you know, a critic of facilitated communication. I just, um, you know, once I learned about learned about it and and, and saw all the peer reviewed research, and um, you know, it, it was just clear to me that I, it, being a reporter, I was also at an independent student newspaper, which helped. It kind of gave me freedom to know that it wouldn't be ramifications, things like that. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was important to to kind of bring to light that the. I mean, some people were aware, but a lot of people weren't, and I thought you know, it was an important thing to bring light to and, and to, you know, make sure that people in Syracuse knew about. So were you, were you aware of facilitated communication before you got to Syracuse or was that something that you learned about when you got to Syracuse? Um, yeah, I learned about it while I was there. It was like weird. I was, um, I think I was home 
on winter break or that's kind of irrelevant, but yeah, I think I was home on winter break and, and watching a documentary um, where it just happened to come up and I didn't really know what it was, but um, you know, quickly I realized that uh, Syracuse obviously had a lot to do with it. Um, so it was, I just sort of kind of, uh, you know, what's the word I didn't, I would, it, it just kind of stumbled upon it, I guess. Uh, it, it was just something that while I was just watching this random documentary, it, it happened to come up during it. And it, I just, from there, I just kind of ran with it, I guess. But yeah, I just stumbled upon it. Honestly, I didn't, it, it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we meet a lot of people that don't know what it is or, or thought that it, it disappeared in the mid 1990s. So it's not surprising that you didn't really know what it was yeah i, yeah. I totally understand why you would never heard of it i mean why yeah. should anybody it's, it's a discredited pseudoscience discredited 30 years or more ago yeah yeah and um uh, i mean i although the university does promote it obviously but it's not like front and center so even while you're there it's easy to miss because you know they're not exactly bragging about it <laughs> so Interesting. Do they yeah, call it facilitated communication? Well, they changed the name. I think they call it something. The actual practice they call something else too. They have a. They've said like assisted typing. I think there's like rapid prompting. They have all these different names, but mm -hmm. they actually changed the name of the institute too from the facilitated communication institute. You probably know this, but no, no. The, but go ahead and say it. It was the facilitated communication institute, and then they renamed it. I think after it was covered in the New York Times, um, and they just got some bad publicity from that. And so they, they kind of wanted to get away from, I think the phrase facilitated communication. So they changed the name of the research institute to, by the time I was there, it was called like the Institute on Communication and Communication and Inclusion, I think was the name, but it, nothing really changed like materially about what they were doing. It was sort of the name and they, they, they didn't call it facilitated communication, but as far as I could tell, it was the same thing. Right. That's pretty suspicious whenever things have to change a name, but nothing actually really yeah, changes. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, is this a pyramid scheme or what is this? <laughs> is this a cult? Why are we calling it by a different name now, but nothing's changed? Yeah. It kind of makes I, I have, I found a newspaper article that, that um, quotes somebody as saying they changed it purposely to fly under the radar after like uh, Prisoners of Silence came out in the, in 1993 and then they received a lot of negative press after that. So, oh, so maybe it was much earlier than I realized when they changed. The um, I think it was more like a, towards the later 1990s. Okay. I'd have to look up the date, but I so think it was it well was before. That. So I was wrong because I, I, for some reason, I just, I don't know why I thought that, but well, it might it sounds, have sounds like it sounds like it probably happened a while ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd have to look. I don't know what the date, I can't remember the date. Yeah. Okay. In any case, they changed their name once they yeah, got they some. They did. So I want to go through this timeline because. I don't really follow it really well. So, okay, so everybody who's out there listening. So Syracuse, New York has this university and it has, it is the hub of facilitated communication. It came from Australia. Uh, uh, this man named Bilkin. Bicklin. Hug Bilkin or Bicklin. Bicklin went over to Australia, learned about facilitated communication. So this is amazing. Brought it back to to the Syracuse University. That's why it's at Syracuse, because I guess that's where he was. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is amazing. And he started this institute. So fast forward a ton of years after it's been totally discredited, they had to change the name. And then we have a, a, a newspaper there. It's called the Daily Orange. I guess that's their school colors is orange. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Syracuse Orange is the name of the, like our, our mascot is an orange or their mascot. <laughs> And you're not even from Georgia. So <laughs> that's a whole nother story about why they had to change their mascot. They had a, um, a, a racist mascot for a while. But anyway, yeah. we can, that's oh, another that's discussion. Yeah. That's interesting. We have so, that in Maine. Yeah, we have that in Maine because a lot of the names were based on um, the Native American tribes that were here. So they were mm -hmm. they were considered um, not to uh, yeah, racist. So we, yeah, yeah, we've had a lot of. Oh, interesting. Well, there's still a bunch of teams that. Well, but that's another. <laughs> I don't want to get to it. So we could have a whole two hours we on that. A whole two hours on that. <laughs> so what we did is um, so okay, so let me see if I can follow this and guide you guys through this. So, facilitated communication is being taught at the university under whatever name it's being taught under, and you decided, um, so. 
you said you happened to see a documentary randomly about facilitated communication. It made you go, oh, what is this? I'll look into it. And it's being taught at Syracuse. Is that what it was that made you? Yeah, it was totally like lucky, honestly, that I, that I found, you know, and when I saw it, because I, <laughs> when I, when I looked it up, I had no idea that I was about to find out that Syracuse had something to do with it. I just, oh, so I guess I'm just, I, you know, oh, I get it. Okay. So you were, so you're just like, oh, wow, this is interesting. Let me figure this out. And then you're like, wait, this is here. Yeah. You know, I was actually watching it, um, with my stepsister, I think, and she had heard of it. And so she started talking about how it was like this crazy thing. And, um, and so I just, you know, it just intrigued me. So <laughs> It is pretty, pretty yeah. hot. Yeah. yeah. You'd be holding people's so, hands. Do you remember the documentary? No, I don't even remember what it was called. I don't think it was the PB. I know, didn't PBS do a, a documentary? Or, yeah, it's or, called Prisoners of Silence. Yeah. I don't one. think that's what it was, although maybe it was, uh, but I, for some reason, I think it was something else. Uh, There's Autism is a World, um, Wretches and Jabbers. I don't know what there, there's been, there was a, um, just like a, a popular, like a movie kind of, of facilitated communication too, but I don't remember the names of it. Didn't There wasn't a 2020, was there? There were several early on. I don't know, unless unless you came across it, like in 2000, the 2012, there was a um, documentary about the Wendro case, which is was in Michigan. Um, but that yeah, was, that would have been- this is because yeah. you graduated in 2018. Yeah, right? so I saw this stuff. But this documentary, it was just on like some random channel on cable, I remember. Um, That's so cool in some yeah. way. But yeah, this would have been winter of 2016, December 2015, January 2016. Yeah. So here, so here he is. He looks into it and he says, hey, I think I'm going to research this and write an article on it. Is that what you did? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I was... A young reporter and I just it just seemed like it you know I, I knew that the, the Daily Orange had never really written about it um so yeah I just I mean I think it was just to me immediately it was a you know I thought it was a fascinating and important story um to tell um you know I think for obvious reasons but I can I can talk about that more if you want right yeah dude because yeah. right, right. like obviously I looked at it and said oh there's something to this yeah. And then other people look at it and say, well, I can see through, you know, I can see that it's facilitator influenced. And so I'm always curious about like what thought processes other people had. I think that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, you know, immediately if you start looking up this stuff, you, you realize that, um, you know, not only is it discredited by, you know, research and you know, scientific evidence but you know there are all these examples of ways that it's actually affected families and people's lives because so i think as journalists when you see that 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 kind of makes it you know when you see how it literally you know affects people i think that sort of brings you in a little bit because that gives it more importance i Absolutely. think um and and to me it was just you know i i think i always thought it was important um when you're covering you know covering syracuse the, the university i always thought it was important to you know, like any journalist would want to, you know, hold them accountable for, you know, anything happening um, at Syracuse that maybe shouldn't be happening or, or, you know, people would question whether it should be happening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just, um, you know, the university was promoting and, and giving credibility to something that, um, you know, all the evidence said, you know, doesn't seem to work. So, you know, that in itself, just um, especially when, like I said, you you realized sort of the consequences of that. Now, did you get did you have to get approval or anything like that from an? Well, oh, I had ed I had editors, but they were students too, and and they were. I remember my editor at the time thought it was like fascinating, and maybe fascinating is the, the wrong word. I don't want to make yeah, but you know, she thought it was an important it is story. Interesting, yeah. yeah. But she thought it would be an important story to write, and and she was behind it immediately. So, yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I had to work with my editors, but um, it wasn't like, you know, we're completely independent financially, the, the student newspaper in Syracuse is, so we didn't have to get approval from, you know. Okay, that's what I was wondering. And yeah. then, so what was the first article that you wrote about? It was the, 
the first yeah, so there was the bit there was one really, and that was quite long and then there were a couple other things that i couldn't fit into the story so i just kind of broke those out and wrote a couple of other shorter stories one that was actually kind of janice was really featured in that because i wanted yeah. to i, I remember think that might have been the second one uh the first one there was one called Double. Yeah, Double Talk. Yeah, that was Double Talk. Was that the first one? Yeah, that was the that was the really long story, and, and that was sort of the the main story. Um, and that one, I just I, I went back to try to look at it today, but basically, I mean that that was like I said the main story, and just tried to give it history and also just you know explain right. exactly what. So I'm the linking situation. these all on our Facebook uh, feed if anybody's interested in finding these. Also, you'll be able to find all these citations, these uh, citations on the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication, because um, that's where uh, the one-stop shop for everything, right? Is go to Wikipedia, you'll find these citations if it's a real well-written Wikipedia page, it is. And I think that I don't remember, I you know, it kind of is a blur when you reread them. I was rereading them today, and I was telling Janice before you got on the line that. These are really good. Uh, you could hand this article to somebody who's never heard of facilitated communication, I think. And I think that they would get a very good overview of, of the history of it, as well as the harm of it and what it is. So, um, you know, we were really impressed when these Thank came you. out. Now, wasn't there a bunch of back and forth uh, between uh, people who are at uh, uh, Syracuse who were who were supporters of facilitated communication. Yeah, so there was- um, Writing something else about it? Well, well, we, um, I'd say we, I don't work in the student newspaper anymore, but I'm just gonna say we, uh, yeah, the Daily Orange, the, the, you know, we always run, we run a lot of letters to the editor. Um, so there were faculty from the School of Education um, where obviously, um, for those who don't know, that's where the research institute is hosted. It's under the, the umbrella of the School of Education. So there were a lot of faculty um, that wrote that signed that letter, sort of criticizing our stories and our editorial. We wrote an editorial also, um, but oh, Janice just disappeared. Here goes Janice. But um, I was like magic. Bye. <laughs> yeah. So we so we ran that letter to. I guess we'll be coming back, right? But we yeah yeah. We, we ran that letter to the editor and yeah, I think when you see that, yeah, look, I guess there was back and forth in that sense because then there were more letters from other faculty sort of responding to them and yeah, sort of was really interesting. defending our reporting. But I, I'll also say, you know, the original letter, I mean, that definitely wasn't representative of faculty as a whole on, on the whole across the university. That was from one school that obviously was, the you know, like I said, the School of Education hosts the Institute, but across you know, the rest of the schools on campus, I think most faculty seem to um, appreciate the, the stories. Yeah, well, that was, it was, it was really interesting because, you know, when we're writing this Wikipedia page, we're going into depth and uh, Janice and I got together and we put together this group called True Voices. And it was to be, it was where we were trying to get more activism. We were trying to become much more active and we were uh, writing, Janice organized this really amazing letter with it's signed by about 30 people who were most more or less all have uh, PhDs or MDs. And we sent the letter to University of Northern Iowa, uh, Syracuse, um, I think Vermont. And it was basically saying, hey, we know this is a pseudoscience. You know it's a pseudoscience. And if you didn't know, you know now. So we're, we're, we're letting you know that if in the future, if something were to happen, here comes Janice. Okay. If anything were to happen, I have the letter in. If anything were to happen where another um, parent is accusing you of, of uh, hey, she's back. If anybody was to accuse you of um, another facilitated communication uh, snafu where the parent is, is being accused of uh, molesting a child or something like that, now the university's kind of has no grounds because to say, oh, we didn't know because we made sure that they they knew. So one of the things I'm interested in is what pushback at all did you get from the the faculty, professors, anything on on campus? Because it, you know that takes a lot of nerve to be a student paper at a university and to write the stuff that you were 
writing, even though it was accurate and true and you were supporting science, but it must've been a lot of pressure. That's what we were saying to ourselves. We're like, oh man, check these guys out. They're going for it. It was great. It was great to read. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what now? Oh, there's another one out. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, anytime you do a story that is that sensitive and, and requires that much reporting and um, yeah, I guess you're always anxious, but I mean, Maybe I was naive and should have been more worried about feedback or pushback. But I mean, to me, it was pretty, I had no reservations, I guess, about what we reported. I just, right. um, and so that made me feel good. And, and yeah, there was, you know, people who responded poorly in the school of education. Um, but, you know, overwhelmingly from, you know, my own professor in the journalism school um, and just other faculty that I knew and uh, you know, the response was positive. Um, and I think a lot of faculty, because a lot of faculty across the campus are aware of, you know, especially the ones that have been there for a while are aware of the Institute. And so they were happy, um, but there, I, that, that, that it came to light. Um, and I think a lot of them are pretty embarrassed. Um, I know a lot of them are, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, um, I just know, just, I, I've just talked to faculty who, um, just in other parts of the university, um, you know, in the, the other colleges, you know, like the College of Arts and Sciences and, you know, a lot of the faculty who are, especially ones who are really engaged in, you know, things that happen at the university outside of their department, you know, and, and that have been there for a long time, because obviously uh, there's, there's faculty who have been there for decades. And, and, and I think they just, you know, being academics are, you know, kind of see the, the Institute as a black guy um on the university um it was it's it's an embarrassment i think yeah i mean this is supposed to be a university with it, it discredits the whole university's commitment to evidence and science and you know it, it just was silly yeah and that's a shame that 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 people would would feel that way but i mean that would be justified but because i know that there's uh, there's no other place on campus i don't think or at least there's that that would get a, that would allow something like that to happen. I mean, there are, there are great faculty and, and and great departments and yeah yeah. The totally communication agree. sciences department actually has on their website a notice that says we do not support mm -hmm. facilitated communication or supported typing in any way. Um, I spoke to to somebody behind the scenes and um, I just got the sense that they were really weary of of fighting it you know they do and they they but they're not the the educators aren't the decision makers at the right. university so without administrative support I think that it, it may be a little bit more difficult to make change even though people are trying from the inside to to make changes um, the administration seems to be turning a blind eye and and have for a long time yeah uh, yeah I think that that's that's totally yeah. accurate. I, and also, I mean, the faculty who, who would be the ones that would be, you know, engaged enough to do something like that. I mean, they have other stuff going. It's hard to really mobilize and to when, especially when it's been there for so long, long and it just seems like kind of, you know, like what's the point of trying, I think. I mean, I can't speak for most of the faculty. So well, that's kind of what we're hearing from the administrators. Isn't that Janice? You would hear from professors and things that would say, Man, I wish there was something we could do about this, but we got to keep our mouth shut. I don't have my tenure yet. I have, um, you know, that kind of thing that was happening. Yeah, not not just at Syracuse, but other universities yeah. across the country are saying, you know, I can I can speak up, but only so far. And then people, um, administrators, start pushing back on them not to talk to reporters or not to. Um, mm -hmm rock the boat too much or whatever this actual real pressure on people's jobs to to stay quiet even though it's sort of a it seems to be a no i think there's more people who don't believe in facilitated communication that actually do but the 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 power of facilitated communication and the story behind it um kind of locks people that that gets more attention and brings money into the universities and and kind of makes it hard to say no we don't want that on our on our campuses um especially where like at syracuse where it's so established mm -hmm. um, and 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 doug bicklin um uh, the, the one who 
brought it over from Australia. Um, that was in the 90s. And then in 2005, he actually became dean of the School of Education, oh. long after, which I think tells you something about sort of that school. And, and I mean, by that point, 2005, I mean, there was no reason to, I mean, the evidence was out by that point. I mean, that was 15 years after, um, or 13 years after they launched the Institute. So um, I think he was, uh, you know, it was, it was supported by people who were, you know, that were a pretty big deal at the university. So the question, we're, we're getting a question and we get this often about the money. Um, yeah. you know, why is this, why is, why is something that is the pseudoscience, um, what, why is the pseudoscience allowed to, to exist there when the, they should know, or at least the upper administration should realize that this is discredited, even while well, everybody kind of knows it's discredited and it's an embarrassment and a black eye on the university. Is there huge amounts of money involved, I, which I would suspect, is it from donors who are, um, who want to see this continued? Oh, this cat is something else. Sorry, you guys, um, my cat just thinks he's, I don't know what he thinks. He's, he thinks. Yeah, he, I, I honestly don't, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Um, just because I didn't really, you know, look and dig into that or report on that as, as much as I probably should have. Um, yeah. You know, obviously there was. Um, no, you did a lot. To, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you did a but, lot. Yeah, so I, 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 I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to speculate too much uh, but as to the reason. I, but the, the one thing I will say, which I said a minute ago, is, you know, the guy who who launched the institute originally, Doug Bicklin, you know, is a pretty big deal at the School of Education. Uh, and so maybe that has something to do with it. You know, maybe he just has a lot of influence and, and, and power there. Um, but um, yeah, as far as money, I mean, I know obviously the school of education has big donors and stuff and maybe they um, have something to do with it. And I know there are definitely donors tied to um, FC, but I, I, I guess I just don't want to speculate too much as to- yeah. We're pretty yeah. sure that's what is doing. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of money and and some with these donors, and they it's it's in their interest to want to keep it yeah functioning. So right. you talked a little bit about what kind of pulled you into the story. Can you talk about some of the the um the the like human interest kind of stories that you found with facilitated communication? Um, there were some that were featured in your articles. Yeah. Um... I don't remember. I, I, if you can remember. Yeah, let me, because I know that there was, um, a, I know at least one of them had been, you know, written about before, but there was a man um, in Canada, uh, I believe, who was separated from his son, uh, who had supposedly, through facilitated communication, accused him of, of sexually abusing him. Um, and yeah, he went to, uh, he was incarcerated, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, you know, the, the claims were found to be unsubstantial. Um, but, I, mean, I, you know, he, obviously that had a profound impact on him. And then there was a similar case uh, that I featured in the story. Um, there was a family, two parents, um, who were also accused of sexually abusing their child in Michigan. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was, I mean, I've never, I, I don't have kids, but I can't imagine if, you know, many things more, you know, awful than that to, to be, you know, you know, if you didn't, obviously if you didn't do something like that to be accused of that. And, and, um, and so, you know, I think, that, like I said earlier, you know, hearing those stories and, and like for David, I mean, he, he, told, he was pretty open um, with me about, you know, what that did to him. I think he, thought about killing himself at, at, mm. at one point. Um, and this is the father you're talking about. Yeah. This is the father from Canada. Um, and you know, he, uh, was depressed. Um, and, and even after the case was dropped, I remember him telling me he, he, he was depressed, um, because, yeah, imagine uh, people are going to yeah. say, you know, the charges were dropped doesn't mean yeah. you're yeah. not guilty kind of thing. They're going to say, well, maybe there is something. I always thought he was kind of creepy and, 
you know, I don't want to. Yeah, I, I remember, sorry, I just pulled the story. One of the things was that he, and this is like surreal to read, but he, um, because he was so shaken by it, he, he, he decided to get this really controversial um, therapy uh, that resulted in him. Um, really? they, they, yeah, they, this is how he recounted it to me based on the stories that he was electrically induced with seizures in an effort to relieve oh, yeah. psychi psychiatric illnesses. I did really um, and he lost like a bunch of like several months of his memory. Um, so that, that, that was an extreme case, obviously, but I mean, to, to hear stories like that, yeah, that's just, you know, when it um, just gives a story and the topic that much more important. Wow. Yeah, I don't, that, I, that's heartbreaking. It was very heartbreaking. Um, the uh, so so then after all this, um, you know, I, I wonder if it had any impact. Did it kind of just the stories you're writing, the pushback you were giving? Then it was a year or two later than when Janice and I got involved, I believe, right, Janice? After was it 2000? When did when did we start talking about this stuff? When did I meet you? 2014, uh, 2017, I think. 17. I was 17. In, I was in Poland when I met. Um, Lillenfeld, Lillenfeld, and said, "All right, I'm done with this. We're gonna we're gonna start getting aggressive." So that was in 2017. Yeah. And yeah, so, I met. What well, did I this met really the, happen right after? I, I didn't realize that 2018. Yeah, so it'd be. Yeah, we had um, Susan and I met through the Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Project, which um, is a group of volunteers that that Susan runs that. Um, uh, edits wikipedia for scientific and and science and yes like, yeah, reliably sourced information and so i got interested in that and the first thing i said to susan was i want to write about fc and she's like no you can't yeah, do that sorry. you get a conflict yeah. of interest <laughs> you, you cannot do that you have a conflict of interest <laughs> but i said you know we'll look at it eventually because I want to, you have to be trained and you have to know what you're doing. And, and I went to, and, she, and Janice just took to like a duck out of water. She started writing about alien abductee people. Yeah, I like all that kind of weird. And, Bigfoot and all sorts of really amazing stories and DNA. Um, people who recreate human faces based on DNA they found on gum or whatever, some kind of thing on the ground and really interesting things. And then we came back to the facilitated communication later. And right. that was a huge project working on uh, rewriting the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication. And yeah. so that would have been probably 2000. Oh, I have it right here. Ugh, I could probably figure it out. Um, 2018, when, when did that Wikipedia page page went in? I don't remember. Anyway, so it's, it's an inch. I'll, I'll know in a second. And I'll also tell you how many times the page has been viewed as soon as I can log on. Yeah. So you, um, yeah. So. Susan met Scott Lilienfeld is a is a, a professor that writes about pseudoscience a lot and he's written about facilitated communication and um, because of my experiences Susan kind of knows the the skeptical world and then the the I because of my experiences after I, I wrote an article in 2012 that talked about my experience with as a facilitator and that's how I. Of, of, is that how you found? I, me? I think so. I remember you wrote something that I that I had found, and that's how it's I. A, it, and I'm um, surprised. It was 2015. We wrote that okay. page in uh, March of 2015, and it's about to have 300,000 page views. 298,942 times that yeah. Wikipedia page has been accessed, and then the rapid prompting method is um that was later i think yeah it was much later it was um april of 2017 and it's only been viewed 40 about almost 44,000 times it's not as big a deal as facilitating communication and one of the things michael we've done so we're not just writing wikipedia pages we're kind of more of an activist kind of thing every time facilitated communication changes its name to another name or they use something else we alter the Wikipedia um, algorithm so that if somebody was to type hand over hand or spelling to communicate or something like that into a Google, 
they're probably going to get the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication. So every time, if so, if they try to change, it comes back to facilitated communication in the end. And so um, it gives another excuse for people to say, I didn't know, you know, yeah. it's like, well, do you know how, do you ever use your computer to Google? <laughs> you don't even have to go to Wikipedia. Right, right. You have to just put it into Google or any search engine. You should get the facilitated communication, hand over hand, um, spelling to communicate. I'm trying to think of all the others, but there's a bunch. Informative pointing. Yeah, it's got all kinds of names. <laughs> yeah, it's several. Reported yeah. typing or assisted typing, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, so, so, um, so the for me at least, one of the reasons why I mean, I I know that you had interviewed me, so I I had a. You were lucky too. That's a rare thing to interview yeah. Janice. <laughs> You have to go through some gatekeepers to get to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of my, some of my experts, friends that I've I've met because because I was vocal about early on about my experiences. The science, for me, once the veil was lifted, um, I went through double blind testing. I I kind of understood the science behind it. I, it took me. It's taken me a long time to understand some of the psychological effects of of going through that kind of experience. But at least I knew fairly early on by by Prison of, of Silence, which was 1993. I understood that that FC was facilitator authored and not that's all it can be really. Um, and one of the reasons why your article um, said it out is that what we've seen is usually there's like this feel-good story like there's usually a title about a miracle or you know this this um unlocking the silence or that kind of stuff in the title then they have like a feel-good story and then two or three lines of the well the some critics say that this isn't real and yeah. then there's the rest of the well, book. We don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about something. Right, is about you know, <laughs> well, we put it in the, here. the child telling the, the mom that they love them oh, and I stuff like you. that. Yeah. So your your articles are one of the, some of the few that have been written, and there have been others, but uh, some of the few recent ones that didn't take that approach. I mean, you, you, uh, so I was curious about how you kind of decided how to yeah. how to put your article article together. I, you know, it, it yeah, stands out. Yeah. Um, well, I hope I don't, you know, say things I've already said. But um, you know, I mean, for me, it, it, once I kind of, you know, learned about and, and read about the the double blind studies and and all the peer reviewed research, um, you know, it just, it just seemed obvious to me that, that that was the lens that the story needed to be told through. I mean, you know, I, I, you're right, obviously there, there have been a lot of feel good stories, um, but to me and, and I think to, you know, you know, any journalist is good at their job, you know, I think that's just malpractice to, to frame something like this. That How do we way. find more, more uh, <laughs> journalists work yeah. with like you? We need more <laughs> Michael Burks. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to, the, my story to, 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 you know, represent the truth as accurately as possible. Um, and that's just what I tried to do. And Rob Palmer's already given you a big bravo. <laughs> <laughs> so... How do you yeah. decide about balance? You know, I know people yeah. talk about, um, you know, like there's a false balance or balance or whatever. Like, how do you decide? Because obviously there are still two sides of the story, but. Right. Yeah. Well, there's not, um, you know, there's no like rule, there's no rule book for, for that. You know, you kind of have to use your judgment, um, I think. And, um, you know, when there's, a controversial topic that has two opposing viewpoints, you know, I think in a lot of cases, you know, you often have to just maybe not necessarily give equal weight because um, it doesn't every doesn't have to always be 50 50 you know I don't I think that's sort of a false view of balance but you know typically when there's two sides to an issue you, you do have to give weight to both viewpoints if you think they're both based in, you know, fact to some degree or in reality but um, you know, with some subjects and, and, you know, what's right and what's wrong and what's truth and what's not true um, is like super obvious. And I think FC is, is one of 
the subjects and mm -hmm. it's sort of almost like a really rare case and it's like so up you know that there's not a lot of topics i've written about that are so you know to, controversial i guess for lack of a fair term where you know all the scientific evidence only supports one side you know most most times you, that you write about a controversial topic you don't have you might have a a guess or an educated guess to say you know that maybe some people are more right about it than other people but you know usually you don't have this really clear-cut scientific evidence um that you have with with fc um so i think that you know in that case i think balance and you know really just being objective is is um means that you know in my opinion is the, the the reporting should reflect you know what the scientific evidence says mm -hmm. and that's just what i tried to do um right yeah i think i think the controversy is that it's still being used at all that's the controversy yeah it depends yeah on who you talk to yeah and there are people who obviously think it works but they don't have you know much hard evidence of that so um yeah, yeah, I think maybe if I could do it again, maybe I would have spent more time trying to find, you know, parents that, you know, participated and had their children participating in it just to, you know, try to understand a little more about, you know, what exactly it was that um, roped them in, I guess. But, you know, I think overall, you know, I think the story was reported as it should have been. Yeah. Yeah, it was a strong story. Yeah, I mean, your focus was on Syracuse and their yeah. and their role in it, and and I think the what keeps parents in facilitated communication is a totally different story. I think there's mm -hmm. there's issues around that that are understandable, perhaps, um, but it's a different story than the one that you you wrote. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. a good point. Right. Yeah. So I, one of the things I wanted to mention on the um, uh, article, let me pull this up here real quick. One of the articles, and I put these in the I put these in the Facebook group. If you guys want to be able to read this, there was one article you wrote called "How Facilitators Control Words Typed in Facilitated Communication Without Realizing," and uh, there was one comment, and I want to read this comment. And everybody, pay attention to this oh, one comment this. because I think this is extremely revealing. So it's uh, written by somebody named Minta Greenblatt. Lin Greenblatt, I don't know how to say it. Here's what she says. It's just a small paragraph. So bear with me here, you guys. This article is complete bullshit. Don't believe any of it. It's simply not true. I and a special ed teacher who facilitates two teenagers, both have very specific voices these two nonverbal children have a complete and intact mind, and I am not controlling their hands, intentionally or unintentionally. They speak for themselves 100%. One bad facilitator does not spoil the whole bunch. They're talking about Janice. <laughs> um, I have met over a dozen nonverbal adults in Syracuse training courses and many more in a Massachusetts training course who would simply have no voice without facilitated communication. These people are grateful to be heard. The female teenager came to my house with her mom. Okay, here, here, here's, this is where I really want you to pay attention. The female teenager came to my house with her mom who facilitates. So the mom's facilitating for her daughter, who's a teenager. And she greeted my husband. I guess that means the teenager greeted her husband. When he commented that, I guess that'd be her husband, that it looked like her mother was moving her hand. She, I guess that's the teenager, got very sad and said, said through the mom, that she wished people wouldn't discredit facilitated communication, that it discredits her and her voice, and that FC changed her life. This article is complete and total bullshit. <laughs> I, this is amazing comment. Janice, you yes. want to break it down? <laughs> circular logic. Yeah, yeah, circular. Circular logic. Yeah. I mean, they. Um, that's not untypical of the comments that we often receive. I've received personally and, and people who speak out opposing the, the 
the technique of facilitated communication often get accused of shutting down people's voices or the rights of people with disabilities. Is that something that you came across, Michael? Um, I'm sorry, could you? Could you well, uh, I, I think people, people who are who speak out against um, oh, yeah. the technique of facilitated yeah. communication are often accused of of being against people with disabilities. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, yeah, definitely there, uh, there, I've seen comments like that one where, you know, they um, basically say what she said that, you know, these nonverbal individuals are, you know, they can communicate and it's not fair to, um, you know, you, you're, um, I'm trying to think of exactly what they say, but, um, yeah, they, they they basically accuse you of of underestimating their cognitive ability um and you know i'm not i i you know i'm not a, i didn't do take disability studies in college so i so i don't want to step too far out of my lane but you know one point that was made to me by by you know the people who have researched this is that you know just assuming that someone with disability someone who is not verbal assuming that they can communicate um or expecting them to be able to communicate, um, that in itself is is not necessarily fair, um, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't really know how to you know to to respond to, to people who think that um, you know you're against people with disability. I mean, you know, I, there's you know if you know the evidence says that this facilitate communication thing just doesn't work. I'm, that's not um, that doesn't mean anything about the individuals that, you know, that are nonverbal, it's not a knock against them. It's not, you know, meant to be a criticism of, of them um, at all, you know? Well, they see it that way. Yeah, I know they but do. But you challenge them and I mean, it's like, well, you know, I'm thinking of it from the scientific view is that, okay, this is a wonderful, a miracle, amazing thing. How do we know when it's working? How do we know when it's not working? How do we yeah. know if it's a facilitator influence? We need to have to have some way of testing this. We can't just yeah. blindly assume that everybody you're holding their hand and typing something is actually communicating. There must be some limits to it. Same thing with the psychic world, absolutely. So, I mean, I don't believe in psychics at all uh, that there's any way of them communicating. But the point is, is that if you say it to them like that, it's like, okay, we're not testing necessarily let's just let's just make sure we have some parameters at what point do we think it's facilitator influence at what point do we think that they're actually communicating so we need to we need to have some way of get, gauging this and so let's i mean if these people are going to school and they're going in their and they're taking tests they're tested they have to be tested they're they're graduating college they're graduating high school so of course they're tested so the idea of saying oh we can't test these people because if you do, it's going to make them stressed, and it's and then maybe you're saying yeah. that actually they don't, they're not communicating. But in the story that this comment that I was reading to me that it's so telling is because she says right straight up, we went to my husband saw yeah. the mother hold, moving the hand, and yeah. whenever we asked the teenage daughter, who is being facilitated by the mother. The mother and the daughter are holding hands. The mother, the daughter supposedly says, no, I am, don't, don't make fun of it. It's, I wish more people believe. Of course, my mother's not moving my hand. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. like I, yeah. Can't, yeah. I can't even get my mind around how after she typed it, if she reread what she wrote, you know? <laughs> what, I, right. what I find curious is that we know that we know that false allegations of abuse have have occurred. We know that even in the FC literature, they'll say, "Well, some of the fil facilitators believe that they're moving the person's hand," and then they have an excuse after that. You would think, after experiences like mine, and and part of the reason why I went public is to to help other people learn about it. Um, but you would think that, that the reaction would be, oh, we better check. We better make sure that I'm not the one that's moving the person's hand. But instead, what's the, and that's, you know, the, the, I would say that's the difference that I've experienced between 
the um, proponents and people who are, are looking at it with a more critical view is the people with a critical view are like, well, let's let's explore this and see what's actually happening. Right. I'd love Whether to roll it out good, to everyone. Good, I good bad, or different, you know, like, yeah. I mean, this terrible thing happened, but let's explore it and figure out what happened and why. That's the right. general um, feedback that I've gotten from people who are critical or more scientifically minded. People who are proponents though, instead of saying, oh, I better make sure that I'm not one of those bad facilitators they're just like accusing you of being bad yeah and, and yeah i i would say that even in my own experience there was like a window of time that i was saying like after the testing i was saying to myself well maybe i just need more training mm -hmm. you know and it, it didn't go that way i had i had an experience that sent me off in a different direction but i can i can understand um uh, uh, that feeling of, of well maybe maybe I just need to be a better facilitator that kind of instead of saying well maybe FC doesn't work at all that there's not there's not those options for people and when they're when they've got the facilitated communication mindset you know whenever right. they called you a bad facilitator um isn't that the facade the fallacy uh no true scotsman I'm asking Rob because, of course. Oh, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. But I think it is the no true Scotsman. It's whenever they say that you couldn't or um, you couldn't possibly. Well, you couldn't possibly be a good facilitator because if you had been, then this wouldn't have happened. So therefore, you're you're not a you're not a real facilitator. Yeah. So I believe that's how the the uh, the uh, facade. That's how it goes. I am really doing well today. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Fallacy. 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 Rob Palmer goes, eh? Hey? Yeah, I, I believe it's the no true Scotsman. When you accuse somebody, when when you accuse somebody of, um, then, and, then you say, well, obviously you're not a really good facilitator. Yeah. It is. Tr just trust me. It's the no true Scotsman fallacy. Okay. So just, but like Jenna said, I mean, it, it is true. I mean, that when you said it more eloquently than I did, Jenna, I mean, they... <laughs> that's the, pretty bad. The, that's eloquent. <laughs> the, no, no, Jenna said, or the, the point Jenna oh, made about the, the proponents of facilitated communication, you know, they don't, they don't really typically respond to, you know, directly to the, the point that the scientific evidence says that, you know, it, it doesn't work. You know, they, they, they respond, as Jenna said, you know, by basically accusing you of, you know, unfairly doubting the ability of, you know, the the people, with the, the individuals with disabilities, which, you know, I, I don't think that's really what anyone's doing. I, I, I uh, and I, and I also think that, you know, blindly assuming that they can type to communicate um, is also not fair to the individuals who are nonverbal. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, do you think they really want to be sitting in a college class with somebody yeah. holding their hand or at a high school class or whatever for six hours or whatever they're doing all day long? Having yeah, to type yeah. out an essay? I, I think that the FC community, um, talk, I know they do talk about presuming competence. And I was. That's um, exactly what I, I forgot yeah. about that term, but that's exactly yeah. what I'm, confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, I'm in a face group. Facebook group of um, speech pathologists. I'm not a pathologist anymore, but I'm in that group. And they were talking about presumed competence and, and they, they came down, it's an evidence-based group for the most part. And they came down on the side of, you're not really supposed to presume anything. You're supposed to look yeah. at this person, do some tests, find out what their skills are and develop a program around that. Like right. if you're if you're coming into that situation presuming competence, well, what if your what if your presumptions are are misguided? Whether whether you're presuming too much or too little of the person, the best way to approach it from an evidence based point of view is let's do some testing and find out what's actually what skills this person yeah. actually has. If they already have some basic spoken language skills, you don't want to teach the skills they already have. You know, you want to you want to develop something around that 
Um, and mm -hmm. I, th I think that's that's another thing that that I find particularly um, frustrating <laughs> over the years with articles like Michael's and and um, and the research that's that's been put out. It doesn't seem like over the thirty years that the the FC community has really been responsive to that. In fact, they don't even look at the evidence anymore. They they say, well, people people tell using FC say it works, so it must work. That that's another way that they generally um, describe it. Um, you received a, an award for this for your writing. Is that right? Yeah, I received actually had. Talk it up, dude. Come on, let's <laughs> so, go ahead. So there was there was one from um, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, or I think speech. Yeah, speech language hearing association, um, and I guess it was they have media awards and they give out a few each year. Just mm -hmm. the, they give the same award I think to a few different uh, organizations, um, and so we got one for it was for the, the double talk story, so the main story uh, that I received one that was 2016. I received that award from the American, just called their media award, and then it also uh, and that award is for it's not just student. Um, newspapers, but you know any media organization is eligible. But then there was a Hearst, which I think they own magazines. Um, yeah, yeah. They they have student journalism awards, and and that place I think it placed. It didn't win the top uh, spot, but it it placed somewhere for like their. Uh, I think it was like. Oh, let me find the exact award. It was, but it was it was a Hearst Award. They do student journalism awards, and in, in, in one of their categories, I think it was enterprise reporting or investigative reporting or something. Mm -hmm. It it got recognized by them too. Um, Rob is so. Rob is going on about the No True Scotsman. He's saying that relating it to the No True Scotsman fall fallacy is that at this point Janice really isn't a facilitator, but at the time she was. Rob. <laughs> just to accept that it is the no true Scotsman fallacy. He's trying to say it's a red herring fallacy. And I'm like, no, no, it is the <laughs> no facilitator uh, uh, would admit she's influencing it. Janice is a facilitator and she admits it then oh whatever. I hate logic. I mean splunked logic. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I, I wanted to say is um Wait, did I you remember that award? Oh the the name of the award. Yeah, it was the it was enterprise reporting from the, the Hearst Journalism Awards program, and it was for 2016 to 17. Oh, that's um, really awesome. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it was nice. Was I got a scholarship like? with it too, which was nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, that was good. Um, I was, I also just mentioned, mentioned a minute ago, I, I remember reading, because Doug Bicklin actually wrote a book um, about facilitated communication and and in it, he, he describes when he first learned about it. And I just remember being struck because you know, there even in obviously, uh, this won't come as a surprise, but you know, there was just nothing in there about whether he actually checked to see if it worked. You know, he, oh, and it was just very obvious for me. That so I just, so I mean, just even the origins of it were just very questionable. Which again, I don't think is surprising, but how amazing that somebody could go and go through it. It really makes you think about their mindset that yeah, he would write a book and not even test the it was <laughs> yeah he just I remember he just like describes me and these two kids and um he said that it contradicted everything he knew about autism um when he saw them supposedly communicate um but then he didn't you know you know it, it's he said it contradicted everything he knew but then he didn't question it further like he just accepted that everything he knew was was wrong it just it was kind of amazing yeah, and when he when he wrote he wrote an article based on that book called Communication Unbound that came out in the Harvard Review in 1990. It was just a short article, okay. well, relatively short compared to the book. Um, and what I noticed when I went back and read it like years later is that he says, "How does FC work, and with whom does it work?" He doesn't say, "Does it work?" He never asked that question. And that was his introduction to uh, um, to the United States about facilitated communication, and it it sounded sciency 
to people like me that didn't have the critical thinking skills. But when, when I went back and, and looked at him, like he never says, does it work? And, you know, and they still don't. I think they've, right. they've kept to that line. They won't, they won't answer that question. Yeah, yeah you're exactly right. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to know more, Michael, what are you, you're, um, you're still as a reporter, your degree is in journalism? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And I think that uh, kudos to your teachers because they did a good job. Um, you're, you're now doing work in the K through 12 exposing things or something to do with the school systems here in California or yeah, uh, what you're trying to do or what you're doing? Yeah, it's, it's not really similar. I don't do a whole lot of investigative reporting right now, um, partially because I'm still pretty early in my career and you kind of have to work <laughs> to be able to get that type of job. But yeah, I cover um, yeah. public schools in Los Angeles, the public school district here. Um, and I also cover higher ed, uh, pub mostly public um, universities and colleges. So the University of California system, the California State University system, um, and the community colleges. So it's it's different than covering Syracuse. Because Syracuse, I um, could you know do stories like FC where it was you know very hyper, I guess not hyper local, but you know it was very Syracuse specific. You know I work for a statewide. Uh, media company now in California. So, um, you know, most of the stories I do have, unless it's about Los Angeles, just because their public school district is so big, you know, most of my stories have to be, you know, about statewide issues. And um, so it's, it's, it's a lot different than covering Syracuse. Uh, so I've wanted to, to write more about FC, um, but if I wanted to do that, it would need to be on a freelance basis. And it's just, I guess I haven't tried super hard to do it, but I've tried a couple times and haven't had any success, you know, getting editors at, on board with. Yeah, you know. paper bills. Well, you're very young in your career yet. That's and true. I mean, you've got a lot of time. I mean, you could you could write a book on it someday, or who knows what you, yeah. you end up yeah. doing with yourself. It's and as you as you may step into who knows what. Look, Lord knows what you stepped into in this. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on with the schools down in LA, and you know, with this. I would think this would be a very timely time to be writing about schools with the uh, COVID-19 and people mm -hmm. being terrified about bringing their kids back to school. I know I'm in California also. I'm I'm about seven hours away from where Michael is uh, up in more, I don't want to say Northern California because I'm not, <laughs> I'm more like um, s uh, the middle of California, but close to the water. Central coast. Uh, Central coast. Yeah, I guess that's what you would call me. Um, but um, I know that LA and San Diego are the biggest school districts to not send their kids to school. They've already just said, no, we're not sending yeah. kids back to school. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big deal. I just heard it on MSNBC before we came over here and started talking that um, I think there's four or five. I think Chicago has just made the announcement they're not going to be doing doing that either. Actually, most of the districts in California now, LA and San Diego were two of the first, but now the, most of- Are they in California? I'm oh, sorry? LA and San Diego are the biggest in California? Yeah, they're the two biggest in California. And LA is the second biggest in the country. Um, but yeah, most of the districts in California actually are not going to be, they're going to be fully online when the, especially any district in any type of urban area. Um, there are a few- um, that will be going having some in person, but most most districts in the state, yeah, they're they're going to be all online to so start me, at least. So um, I'm maybe a little ignorant in this area, but I don't really know how this reporting stuff works. So when you say that this is your gig is to work on that kind of area, do you work for a a newspaper or something that you know a, a company that? you write about yeah. and it always goes there or do you write about the subject and it, and it's sold to wherever it will fit? no I, I i work for a it's a, a news organization called edsource mm -hmm. it's a nonprofit um that just covers education in california um so mm -hmm. i'm full-time employee there on salary and all that so yeah all my work well, sometimes well, sometimes our, my our stories get picked up by so if you're if you live so there's, you know, there's a few different newspaper chains in California, um, and sometimes that they'll pick up our stories and put them in the local newspapers. Um, but generally, you have to go to the yeah, edsource.org if you want to 
Yeah, I'll plug your, plug your <laughs> edsource.org, yeah. education source, I guess. Even. Yeah, yeah. That I think that's, that's, you know, like I said, I think there's a lot still to write about. And I think this is a really challenging time for education, especially, um, you know, the students are finding that they don't, you know, we didn't have forewarning on this COVID-19 thing, you know, if we had too bad, I guess there's no psychics out there. But uh, nobody gave us a heads up because if so, we would have made sure we had every kid had a laptop or something or some kind of tablet and everybody had Wi-Fi and everybody had this, that, and the other. We're all prepared. Everybody had their textbooks with them. You know, we thought maybe it'd be like a week or two or maybe a few weeks we'd be down, but boy. Yeah, it seems like we're in it for the long haul. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any children. We already have it. Right now, but boy, it, if I had children or grandchildren or anything like that right now, I would be, oh no, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm, I, I agree. I mean, grandma's teaching you at home. I don't want her to learn how to, we're going to learn fallacies. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what's happening to all those people that are relying on facilitators to communicate. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I was thinking the same thing because, you know, they have to be so close also, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a facilitator could give the, give it to their, their client or vice versa. I mean, I think that you can't, I just can't see it being done. And, but a lot of parents do their own facilitating apparently. Right. right? So they're in the household. Um, so, yeah, Rob Palmer says that he's expecting great things from you, Michael. Well, thank no you. Pressure right. or anything. <laughs> thank uh, you. Uh, and then Paul Linda, who's down in Hollywood area, and she says there'd be no point. Classes are already too full. They could never do social distancing. And that's true. That's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. I read uh, today or the yesterday they were talking about a school they were trying to open up somewhere and they said it's going to open, but the desks have to be three feet apart and they can only speak forward. You can only face yeah. forward. Like, how is that even possible? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know. I, no, good luck. You turn and look behind you because you might get a face. Oh, and no mass. No mass. You're going to get a face full of the germs of the perp- person behind you. I mean, give me a break. Somebody's going to sneeze in that classroom and everybody's going <laughs> to hit the floor right. like like. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> it's just the silliest i just i i don't know i, I understand it's, it's important for socialization it is a lot of students need to be in school a lot of parents need their kids in school but yeah we're living in weird times aren't we Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, Steph, Desiree Steffi, Stephanie has said, Michael, have you thought of writing anything for some conservative publications and some of the scams being pushed to them? <laughs> yeah, if you want, yeah, this is a community. If you want scam ideas. <laughs> this what about? Is a scam ideas. Not- <laughs> there's a lot of stuff being pushed in, in the schools these days. It's pseudoscience, from what I understand. I think there's... Um, what? I can't think of the name of it, but there's a there's a school that is um, it really pushes the nonsense. I think they were teaching. Now there's one that's teaching. I think it was teaching Reiki and and meditation, which is fine. But some of the other things that were going along with it was pretty pretty unusual. I can't remember what it was, but oh really? Yeah, there's there's especially in these private schools, and um, you know creationism oh my gosh that must be interesting i wonder if there's still a lot of schools in california that teach anything that are, are forcing parent, uh, teachers not to teach evolution and stuff that would be interesting uh, yeah that, i know i don't know about california but i know um, doesn't liberty university teach creationism oh yeah they're very they're very creationist very yeah um, and my and syracuse that schedules football games against them so that's another stain on <laughs> They better not be doing. They better not be doing any um, uh, football with them now, because I'm sure Liberty University doesn't use. Um, I think I heard there was a lot of boycotts against Liberty University because of their practices against LGBTQ people and um, other policies that they have to have students sign to say, "Oh, you know, we're 
or you have to believe in our values and things. I had heard that there was boycotting, but you know, it's like fighting against anti-vaxxers. You know, I don't want to go hang out with anti-vaxxers, even if we're not talking about vaccines, because they haven't been vaccinated, you know, and they're, they may have something I don't want to catch. So there's a lot of reasons why I would think I would not want to hang out with the Liberty. I'm sure that they have a probably high, I'm just saying, not that I know, probably have a high rate of, of um, COVID, um, I would think, because I'm sure they're not masking as yeah. well as they should. Well, they tried to stay open longer than anyone else. Oh, yeah. Where they, re that. they reopened exactly. and they That's had to shut down. I remember that. I, I do remember that. Doesn't Liberty, oh, oh <laughs> Rob says, <laughs> doesn't Liberty always win? They must pray all the time. I would say, you know, I, I, you can't, we can't play with you because you have, you are, you have a in with God right there. So, um, it isn't that unfair advantage? <laughs> Yeah. like some people use steroids well <laughs> anyway i'm getting myself off i'm gonna get myself into a um, bad i should watch myself here Tell me i had i thought i just thought of a question back to fc stuff sure. um, let me tell everybody if you guys got questions get them to us now yeah okay um, okay you talk to both sides of and so i i was kind of curious if you if you um saw any commonalities between the the two groups um not really i mean i don't think so uh yeah i, I, I do you have you seen any commonalities maybe maybe that'll spark something if you if you've noticed any but well the only thing that i can say is that both groups talk about uh, disability rights Mm -hmm. uh, that was both pro, pro are very dedicated to people with disabilities in their own way so i mean that, that i i was just curious mostly um i sometimes think that that the dividing line is it's very small but it's huge at the same time you know it's that that line of who's doing the pointing is is huge but mm -hmm. if you strip all that away in the literature, I'm hearing the same kind of, you know, we want we want better supports for our children. We want um, people with disabilities to be more accepted and engaged in the community and that kind of thing. And, and um, it it sometimes baffles me how close the because I say that because when you're a facilitator and you go to the workshops, you're taught that the the critics are really these evil people against people with disability. You know, it's probably putting it really crudely but that's basically what they mean is don't mm -hmm. talk to those people over there but yeah. my experience has been completely different from that you know um in the science world and, yeah and science Not world. Evil with with horns coming out of our heads no yeah. no and and in many ways much more supportive to me than than the fc community has been but i was just curious if if other people kind of made those connections as well or or if you're so focused on the issue of FC, then you're going to get that dividing line, and they're 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 not close with that issue. Yeah, I think that was sort of how it played out. Was the way my story was written was that it, I was really focused on the idea that it's um, it's credited, and so people on one side obviously dis would dispute what I just said. So, but I think you're right. I mean, they. they the one similarity would be that, um, or at least that I noticed that after you said that would be that, you know, both people on each side of the issue, you know, at least say that they, you know, care about disability, disability rights. I would and, have to agree. Yeah. I yeah. think that both sides want the best for the students. Yeah. And um, I, I think maybe because I haven't been in the world of the facilitator, I feel like I'm, I give a lot of, uh, you know, I think the facilitators go into it really meaning to to do good things. I don't think they go in meaning to harm. I think they really think that they're helping and they have big hearts. And, and uh, Janice probably would say that, you know, after a certain point, you've got to say to yourself, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say that the, there's like a, it seems to be a willful ignorance because like back in, back when I got involved was very early on and the, the, the scientific studies were just coming out. So it was easy for people to point to me and say, 
oh, that was a bad facilitator or the other people. But now my question is, there's a whole body of evidence of people who have been, um, have gone through the double blind testing for a variety of reasons, most of which have not been false allegation of abuse cases. And they were trained at Syracuse University or, they, or other universities and the, the result was exactly the same as what I experienced. So, I mean, I, I say that the science backed up my experience and not the other way around. You know, I, I had this experience, then saw the science and said, oh, that matches more closely than my facilitated communication experience. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I forgot. <laughs> I, I go on these tangents when, whenever we talk about FC. Um, I forgot why, where I was going with that, but I, I think that I think that um, you were talking about the difference between uh, that facilitators should know. Oh yeah, willful ignorance. You know, now there's a there's a body of work, and yeah, that you can't type it in to a computer and not get. I mean, you can't even say on your phone, "Hey Siri," you know, "What is hand over hand?" typing or something and it's gonna no of course mine doesn't get to say it right now yeah, we'll wait yeah. Till later. so it's different it's like at what point page. what point does that change you know where where and the major organizations um american speech and hearing association american psychological association those all have come out you know people are yeah. early on people were really kind of like tentative about saying does this work or doesn't this work? And they were like, maybe that's why it took hold in the way that it did in some ways. People were willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. But now, like um, Michael was saying earlier, that it's weighted so much to the science that it's communicate that it's facilitator authored that I don't know how, I, I really don't understand now how facilitators. Right. Can Let me show you guys something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screen share real quick so everybody can see this. This is the Wikipedia page, and um, you know this is the first thing you're going to see here. Facilitated communication, supported typing, or hand over hand is a scientifically discredited technique. Done. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to read any further. But one of the things Let's check the hallmark, link. This is a hallmark of one of our our project is that we make uh, sure that this little tag gets on here so that you can just visually quickly look at the wikipedia page and go oh facilitated communication oh it's scientifically discredited and it's pseudoscience medicine oh and then oh it's been called the single most scientifically discredited invention of in all of developmental disabilities oh i i don't think this is such a good idea for my son <laughs> or my daughter you know if a parent is suggested that this is what's going to be used now I agree in the last maybe well at least since 2014 when this Wikipedia page was completely rewritten there was one before it's just been completely rewritten correctly with all the case studies a lot of the case studies of the harm that can happen there's no way you can't glance at that page and say yeah I think it's okay for my son or daughter to have facilitative communication no problem go ahead you know and yeah uh, Rob asked the question of you, Michael, uh, have you written anything about the mask and no mask fights in California with the schools? Is that something that you've had to deal with? No. Um, no, Rob. I have not. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, um, if it probably would have come up more if maybe more of the schools were planning to open, because I do think, um, I think the mask first, no mask, but I think most reasonable people know that you should wear a mask. But the one thing with schools is, you know, how do you get little kids to wear a mask all day? I know in other countries that's been a problem. Um, yeah, but I'm touching it. And, yeah, but I don't know. Yeah. I haven't reported on that. Yeah, kids are just going to chase each other and, and pretend to sneeze on each other and lick each other and stuff. Yeah. You know, that's what kids are going to do. They're going to chase yeah. around. I'll lick on you. I'll lick you. I'll stick. I was, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to yeah. sneeze on you. Exactly. It's harder. I got cooties. I mean, I can remember when cooties were bad, but boy, this is <laughs> yeah, this is really bad. <laughs> this is really scary. Bad cooties, you know. Cooties can kill grandma. You know, it's oh, not not a good idea. Um. Okay. Yeah. So, anything else from you guys? We've we've done a good hour and wow, hour and twenty minutes. It's pretty good. It goes fast, huh? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. Talking. Uh, oh, here comes another one. I saw a commercial, a quote of Wikipedia calling something used in their product as a pseudoscience like it was a good thing. Whoa! 
Oh, okay. Uh, interesting. Oh, it says the info is out there. What will it take? I want to answer that one. You can follow up on me, Janice, if you want. I think what it's going to take is going to take the administration to finally stop teaching it in universities and uh, it becomes totally discredited. And the way that's going to happen is people like us um, are going to force the schools to reckon with it and they're going to be defunded um, to some extent. But I don't think we're going to ever be able to fix facilitated communication for those people who are already really into it. There's, I, there's no way you're going to be able to tell somebody, um, oh, I'm sorry, but you know, that's totally discredited in that. And all those conversations you've been having with your son or daughter, um, you haven't been having them with your son or daughter. You've been having them with yourself when you're facilitating for them. And so the, I think the only way we're going to do this is time. If we can, if we can cut off the head of the, of the, of the schools, universities now, and not allow any more teaching of it through the school system uh, and lots of education, like what Janice and I've been doing, these constant talks, educating people. Desiree said she she hadn't, she said a uh, very good presentation by the three of us. She had learned so much she didn't know about this. And it, it's just gonna take some time, but I think this is one of those pseudosciences, let's get to die or go, so far underground that it's going to be hardly used at all. Janice? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I would say that one thing that really, uh, when I was kind of coming out of my FC fog, I was like, well, why didn't, why weren't people talking about this? Why, why weren't people writing about this? But when I went back and did the research, I realized that people had been talking about it and the, the media in some ways captures the miracle stories and, and the, the, the criticism, you know, it's harder to find it, but it's there. And I think that these articles, that's what struck me about Michael, your article is that it's so important to have documentation of people saying, this is, this is the science behind this. This is why I say it's discredited. And this is the harm that it does. Those are so valuable. And even though it seems like it gets passed by, it doesn't pass by everybody. I know I've had personally people come in contact with me saying, because of your story, whether they read it in the newspaper or saw a talk that I gave, because of your story, I questioned it. This just happened this year, actually. Somebody oh, wow. was using FC at work. And I was able to, to talk to them a little bit about it and send them some articles and they changed their mind. It took a little while and it would took, it was courageous of that person, but it does happen. And I think that the people that like have read your article, Michael, or, or some of the research that changed their mind before they even started it, we're never, we're never going to know like how many people that affected yeah. it. It's so Absolutely. important. And, that, and that's, I just, I just commend you for for being able to call it for what it is because yeah. a lot 300, of people have in the past and three hundred thousand views that. on fa on Wikipedia. You know, they they may not go down to the citation and read every article that you've written. I mean, they may not read those, but we've summed them up in the body of the article. So your huh. reporting and the reporting other people have done on facilitated communication is what's making us write these wonderful Wikipedia pages and use the quotes from it and be able to show that this is. Um, you know what it is and if they want to learn more they can go to it Janice and I talk about this a lot by saying that we don't know how many people have gone to your article or your articles or the articles other people have written or to the Wikipedia page walked in and said oh this is something that they're going to start using in my school or they've asked they think it might be a good idea just for my son it might be a miracle somebody at work suggested it they look at the article, they look at the Wikipedia article, whatever, and they go, no, I don't think so. And then they leave. And we we will never yeah, know yeah. about those people because they don't make the headlines. They're not getting accused of sexually abusing their child. We'll, they'll, we'll, we'll never know. Um, I do need to tell you the story of Leonard, though, really quick before we go. Oh, yeah. Recounted today. Rob just reminded me of it, too, um, that he said that he was coming from a conference, PsychOn, in... Um, 
It was being held in New Orleans. It was back in the days when they'd move the conference around and he was on a flight back and he's sitting next to a woman. Remember those days when you'd sit next to somebody on a plane, like you would get on a plane first off and sit next to them <laughs> before, what is it? Uh, liter use the phrase today, BC, BC, before COVID. Before COVID. <laughs> before COVID. <laughs> he said, he said he got on the flight and he was talking to the woman and she, he was, she was asking him where he was and what he was doing. And, and then he was talking to her and she said, oh yeah, my daughter's a poet and she's a genius. You know, she didn't, she, she's, she's an adult and she was kind of locked in and she couldn't communicate. And then she, we found facilitated communication and now she's a poet, she's published and life is wonderful. She can communicate and everything. And Leonard says, I think he said something like, um, I, I'm not sure all the research is in on that. I think there's been some some criticism on that and that it may not work. She goes, oh, I know all about that, but it works for my daughter. Mm -hmm. And he said, he changed the subject very quickly. And yeah. said, he felt really bad because he was, this woman was, you know, he, he couldn't go there with her. And like, it felt like he was actually endorsing her, her a little bit, but he didn't want to sit next to this woman all the way. From it's a hard situation to be in. Yeah, yeah, you know, she's I mean, you're not, you're probably not gonna, yeah, change can I, uh, Stuart, flight attendant, yeah. can I move my seat, please? Yeah, no, I would have done the same thing, but this it was a, it was an interesting idea that he said he felt really bad about it. And, and I told him when we were talking about it today, I said, you know, well, you can't do anything, the woman has already bought into it. There's no way she's publishing books, she's, she's already bought way into it. And there's nothing that can be done for this, for this person. It'd be like, if you were um, in a psychic who is contacting your dead child from beyond the grave and they're telling you all these amazing things about what heaven's like and what the dog looks like and what grandma's hat looked like and you know all these you know just stuff and if you were to say oh well your psychic is a fraud and never ever contacted anybody and ever all those communications you had with your dead child were well guess what she made them up <laughs> Uh, 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 I don't think so. I, I think it would feel like you're losing your child again. It's a hard psychological ask. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, so. I can't yeah. even imagine that. Awesome. All right, you guys. It was really great having you here today, Michael. This has really been fun. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit and talk with us. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a few years, so I, it's like a story <laughs> that keeps living, so I'm glad it's been useful. And, it was um, very useful. And, and I hope... Um, it's on the Wikipedia page as well as it's still obviously in, in, in out there floating around for people to find, but we have it on the Wikipedia page for people. Just go to Wikipedia. There's a lot of citations on there. You guys type in, you know, alt find or whatever it is on your Mac and type in the word orange, orange, <laughs> O-R-A-N-G-E. And you will get at least four articles on there. Two for sure are from Michael. And um, I think they're really great articles that you could hand to somebody and say, here, this explains it really well and in a kind way mm -hmm. with, without, you know, talking down to people, uh, making them sound like they're stupid or something, you know, something you could hand to somebody else and they would understand what, what the problem is in a, in a good way. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope that more people, you know, I, obviously I'm not in Syracuse anymore, but I, I hope that there are more, you know, more reporting in the future because I do think you know speaking to Syracuse at least the only way anything will change is if the the board of trustees there some for some reason feels compelled to right I think when they another, get sued I think this is going to be I think that's all it's going to take is they're going to get sued I think that uh, and once they do and they find out that you know we've sent them this letter and they've signed off on the letter that they received it we have proof that they signed it I mean they knew they received it registered mail and acknowledged it that a lawyer is going to sniff that out and go, really, you knew that this was a problem back in 2019 or whatever it was we sent it. You knew that you, these, all these people explained it. They sent you all these documents you've known yet you continued anyway. So we're going to take some money from you. I think it'll take that. And maybe also the alumni. Yeah. If the alumni put pressure on it, pressure them to the, say, the, you know, the alumni with deep pockets, say. especially. Yeah. And, you know, the, the fascinating thing about Syracuse is that the chancellor is, who's been there now for six years, six years, I think, I think 2014, about six years, 
Uh, he's a lawyer, so you, you, you would think that maybe he would be more cautious, but maybe he's, I mean, he's also, like I said, that it's sort of hidden in the university. It's not, it's probably not top of his um, radar all the time, but they, the university is like, I mean, on the trustees, there's a lot of prominent lawyers. So that's one thing that I've wondered about is that what has no one brought up that maybe there's some liability concerns there, but yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I do do want to mention this too, just because I'm a pain in the ass. But um, if you go to the Wikipedia page, here, let me share screen again. To uh, the Wikipedia page for Syracuse University, you're going to see right here history, founding, expansion, modern, oh, uh, wow. 1988 crash of Pan Am Flight 103, controversies facilitated communication controversy. So okay. right away, it's right there. If somebody's scoping out your university, here it is, facilitating communication controversy, um, they will be able to go down there and uh, uh, and learn about what's going on down there, 64, where is uh, 64, 65. The Daily Orange, look, there you are. Citation number 65, there's, there's the Daily Orange on there. And so if somebody's looking at the University of Syracuse for a possible choice of a uh, place they want to go, and this is also your SIT. And I can't type and and talk at the same time. If you go to the University of Northern Iowa, the same darn thing. It's here somewhere. I must be. Seeing. Did they take it off? No, it shouldn't have been taken off. I don't see it there. Yeah, where in the heck is it? Somebody edited that page. <laughs> All right, who's going to get on it? <laughs> who's on this now but for a long time the university of northern iowa's wikipedia page also had a um a, a heading on there about their use of supportive facilitated communication and uh, we heard from at least one professor who was not too happy about that um i'm like well you know the moment you guys say we're not going to have anything more to do with facilitated communication we'll be happy to take that off the wikipedia page or we will put as of this date Sir, um, University of Northern Iowa has decided they will not have anything more to do with facilitated communication. Yeah, they could be leaders. They could be leaders. Yeah, I, I think it's really frustrating for staff they, because like Michael was saying earlier, there's a lot of really good professors there and, and some of them are speaking out and teaching about the scientific side of FC in their classes. But um, it, I think personally, it does reflect on the whole university if they've got, if they've, if they're because the evidence is so clear, you yeah. know, I, I know there's other other things that are are still being debated, but there's no really real debate about FC anymore, except why is it being yeah. used? And you know what, I'm, I'm going to share one more time because I figured this out. Look at you guys. Here's here's University of Northern Iowa. Here's the lead. Boom. Facilitated communication right here under history. Oh, OK. Oh, it's all there and mentioned four times. <laughs> So, you know, we told them, you better clean up your act. Yeah, what they did was they, they to the media and they wrote articles about it. Darn that media. They shouldn't be writing articles about it because as soon as it gets into the print, then it can go into a Wikipedia page. So I know we're really mean. <laughs> we're, we're trying to publish. We're trying to push them to, you know, sorry. Anyway. Yeah. I don't think they're going to change unless there is some pressure. Yeah, the alumni will be able to do that. And Rob says they need to be publicly embarrassed somehow. And yes, Rob, I just mentioned that it's been publicly mentioned on their Wikipedia pages. So anyway. <laughs> I think it's going to take everybody pushing, like people pushing from all sides. You know, I, I think it's going to take internal pressure. I think it's going to take external pressure. And a the lot media, we all need to, yeah. I mean, I think. What usually happens with FC is there's this miracle story and it, that gets a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, F, the bad side of FC is only brought out when there's false allegation of every kind, everybody kind of jumps on that for a little while and then it disappears again. So and it's if, not really, go ahead. And if I was gonna say, if, for Syracuse to, you know, get rid of that institute or, or stop, you know, acknowledge that you know, FC is something they shouldn't be promoting, you know, that would be, from their perspective, they would, that would mean that they would have to acknowledge that for 30 years, they've promoted a 
a fallacy or, and so I, not that that excuses it, but I think that sort of makes it easier to understand, you know, maybe why they're not willing to do that because, you know, they probably don't want to admit that for 30 years that a university that's, you know, as reputable, Syracuse is pretty, it's not like an Ivy League school, but yeah, a pretty reputable university. I, I don't think they want, they don't want to admit that um, it's easier just to kind of keep it under the rug. Well, don't you think maybe when he retires? Because well, he's I, not the, he's, he's not, not the dean down. anymore. Mm-hmm. He's not, the, you mean the, Bicklin? Yeah. Yeah, well, he's not right. the dean anymore. I mean, he's still, yeah. I think he's still a professor, but he's not the dean. They have a new dean. You would think that that just, you know, some people have just such like personality that you do not want to cross them. And, 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 you know, I could see yeah. that if he leaves, leaves, that maybe then they'll say, you know, we probably should. Janice is like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, his disciples. Janice, I want my fantasy. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> his disciples have taken over. I mean, you, yeah. you've got that. It's a cult of personality in a lot of ways, isn't it? Don't you think? You I mean if somebody drops out who is really the leader behind it, it just takes a couple of years and it just goes wah wah wah. I hope so. It's been several years now, though, with his, yeah, you know, the people that's not been dean. Well, so it could be any dean. Yeah. Any day now. Any day now. <laughs> All right, you guys. This has been fun. So this is going to be reco- this is recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel and Michael will be one of many people on our fabulous, absolutely amazing playlist for facilitated communication discussions. We've discussed the harm. We've discussed uh, Deej, the movie Deej or documentary. We've discussed how it relates to psychics and the idiomotor effect and the Ouija board effect and Clever Hans. And we discussed uh, how language acquisitions and we've discussed Janice's story and how she was she got into this and how she got out of this and we've discussed now with Michael we've discussed from the viewpoint of the uh, uh, the university where this is the hub at Syracuse University where the student uh, newspaper did this really amazing expose on it and we've still got some more stuff we got to do we've got a lot more things planned you guys so check out our playlist like us on Facebook uh, about time project and uh, go to our our uh, YouTube channel, which I put up several times in our um, in the the Facebook chat here. And um, you know, I also want to pitch really quick. Somebody told me tomorrow is Thursday. We're in August now, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm still using a paper, so don't mess with me. I love paper and pencil. I keep my calendar on here. <laughs> All right. So tomorrow, tomorrow. We're going to be, uh, the UK skeptics have a skeptics in the pub talk at 11 o'clock California time. You can check them out every Thursday. Um, Squaring the Strange will be releasing an episode that I have done with uh, talking about uh, psychics. That's coming out tomorrow at three o'clock California time. I will be live, 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 live uh, from New Zealand. Radio New Zealand is going to be giving me an interview, and um, that's going to be at three o'clock. And if you guys are interested in trivia on Zoom, I will be hosting trivia at six thirty. Come and check that out; it's a lot of a lot of fun. And um, I believe Janice and I have some other really interesting talks coming up as well. Howard Shane, um, uh, Jim Todd will probably eventually be here. Other people who are associated with the facilitated communication world. We have a lot more people that we need to interview. We're getting the we're getting the good stuff here for you guys all. <laughs> we're taking full advantage of this pandemic. Yes, we are. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. I really appreciate you. you having me. It was a lot of fun, and I'll get the video and I'll send you a link to it whenever when it comes out in a couple of days on YouTube. Okay. But I'm gonna go over to Facebook and check out all the comments. You can do that. Okay. We're already we're already at a, a bunch of views. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much. You too. Take care.